Hello, everybody. Kyle Haggerty's uh, main apropos of being with us today on uh, this podcast or videocast or whatever it is about being an expat manager and a successful expat manager, hopefully, in China and the Asia Pacific, is his book, The Accidental Business Nomad. So I had the privilege of peeping into this book a little bit even before it was out. And there were a couple of things that I underlined for myself and a lot of things that I kind of unofficially quoted ever since then. But as we know, I think this book has lots of lessons for the kind of people I am working with, whose majority are senior managers in multinational companies, in my case, mostly European companies who are sent to the Asia Pacific they are supposed to take a flight, they are supposed to arrive, they are supposed to log into the system of the company and start working. And we know that that's not the way it happens. And I think this book has a lot of firsthand experience and a lot of good stories for all of those people to learn from. But before we get onto that, I know that every book has a longer story behind it. So my first question to you, Kyle, would be, what made you feel after many, many years in the Asia Pacific that this message has to go out in this form right then when you were working on this book? Well, for, so thank you for inviting me on here. And I think that the um, reason I wrote this thing was because it was like Groundhog Day, meaning the problems that I went through are the same problems that I've seen so many other people go through in variation. It's frustrating, it's expensive, and I've been here now for almost 15 years in region and it hasn't really advanced or changed. And so what I mean by that is what I think you already alluded to, which is these like these moments where it's not business as normal and all these companies, these organizations have gone global, but the argument that I'm making is that people have not. And so I thought that it would be a fun way to write some of these um, in some cases, hopefully amusing anecdotes um, and, and start sharing some of the situations that have happened to me and to others that I saw firsthand or through other stories, um, and then try and put a little bit of guidance around it. What, what can we do about it, right? I'm, I'm not here just to share a bunch of goofy expat stories. It's to say, well, uh, what, what have we learned and, or what haven't we learned, but how can we do this better? And that, that was what I tried to do. And I, I would say that there was one client of mine, he's in the book, uh, or I've, I've mixed and matched all of the names to make everybody anonymous. I think I say at the beginning that I've changed all of the, uh, the, the guilty, you know, the, mm. the, 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 the names have been changed to protect the guilty, right? Uh, but there was one, one client of mine years ago, it was an American company, it was a software company, and he wanted to just get into Asia market. He called it the Asia market. There's no such thing, uh, but he wanted to get in here quick and he wanted to use all of his existing material and he hired me to be his sales and marketing guy. And he, and, and he just said, just sell, sell this stuff. And he sent me his material over and it had like baseball images and it had American spelling and it was crystal clear that there hadn't been a inch of, you know, moment of thought towards any sense of localization, towards, you know, what does it actually mean to expand into a foreign market? Uh, and I was pushing back on him saying, look, you, you send this stuff out and you are making it crystal clear that you are some company on the other side of the planet that does not get it hmm. here. And it's not, you're not gonna sell anything. <clears throat> or if you do, you're gonna have very upset clients very quickly. And uh, he got really frustrated and he just said, look, just slap a dragon on it and, and make it Asian oh, yeah. and we'll be fine. And, and that situation to me was like, that just kind of smacked me across the face in terms of like this mindset where all you need to do is whatever stereotypical or just, you know, nothing or next to nothing. And we can go anywhere in the world do it the way we're used to doing it and things will work out because, you know, our mark, we know best kind of mindset. And so I, I kind of allude to this slap dragon mentality throughout the book because that, that was a real thing that happened and I never forgot about it. I love the reference to the cultural reference. 
I must be honest with you. I, I've been in China since 2002. I'm Hungarian. I'm not a native speaker of English. I got certified to a lot of these internal business academy programs. And those yeah. who came from the United States, I had to look up who Yogi Berra was. Right. Because by Americans, there were Yogi Berra quotes everywhere. And it happened yep. to me on the first training that there was a quote by Yogi Berra. And obviously, those who know the reference, they know that it's like a very deep uh, yes. kind of symbolism because, yep. because Yogi Berra was not a sage. He just, he just stumbled onto certain truths. So yep. I remember that I did this training in the south of China, in Guangzhou. And then they said, so who is Yogi Berra? And, and I said, you know, what? I'm not really sure. I had to, I had to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, dragon is uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that that's uh, so. It's funny. I actually just read a story about because uh, translation and localization is so important, and, and it comes out in these weird, quirky, interesting ways. Uh, cars two, the movie, or mm -hmm. Cars, I guess. Uh, I just read about this. They spent huge amounts of time because in the U.S., the characters that they were not mocking, but they were putting characters together. And, and one of them is this rusty tow truck. And he's sort of this, in the US, he'd be called a redneck, uh, you know, kind of this um, country, you know, uh, guy. And, and so how does that translate in Germany? How does that translate in China? And it was a, it was a cool article because it, apparently some very thoughtful people spent a lot of time figuring that out. And they did a ton of research and they brought in and they found sort of the German equivalent of the regional dialect to do when they were applying it. Because you can't just cut and paste, you know, whatever his name was, made or, you know, this truck, like it, the, the humor doesn't work. The, right. It, it just doesn't translate without mm. having to think about it. And I, I, I just read about it this week and it kind of, it's just yet another example of how, um, if these things don't get thought through carefully, you can get yourself into some trouble. Exactly. Well, one of the things um, that I had to do in the past was to rewrite assessment centers uh, mm. for people Tra who translate, are, who are right? sorry. You were translating into Hungarian, is that right? Well, no, no, no. Uh, the way it goes is that there is, a, let's say, a German or a Dutch company. They have an assessment center to decide who goes to the next level of management or leadership. Yes. And then they put people through this assessment center, and there is a, there is a committee who is observing them through a, a, some exercises, some role plays, and so on. But these things work in a completely different way. And one of them was names, to be on first name basis uh, with somebody. Yes. Which, yes. I mean, um, <clears throat> you used to spend a lot of time in China. Now you are in Singapore, if I'm correct. Uh, yeah. You know that in Asian societies, you're not on first name, first name basis in most countries that we can think of. That's right. Because it just doesn't simply work that way. <clears throat> and <clears throat> that is not simply a question of language translation. That is, a, that is a, a completely different paradigm. That was the, you know, that was the thing that it was one of the aha moments, which was, it's not the surface stuff. It's not the stuff we can hear and see. It's the invisible stuff that, ha you know, I use the word translate lightly here because there's a bunch of this invisible cultural components, our working styles, how we communicate, the first last name basis, you know, the, the business card, that, that's a vi visual thing, but then it's kind of interesting, the background and the reasoning behind some of this stuff, uh, the indirect communication that happens and the reason why it's indirect. Uh, it's not, you know, I, I think I allude to this in the book as well, where you could have a, a value, you know, you, you could have a team value or a company value statement that says, you know, we, on, we, we, we believe that uh, respect and honesty are our two biggest values, but those get expressed in very different ways in different parts of the world. And without spending time digging into that, issues pop up real fast. Give us an example. Some people haven't read your book and they don't know what kind of assignments you were on. And just give us a couple of those groundhog moments. So what was it when you said to yourself, oh dear, not this again? This is, here's, here's one that's very common in virtual teams, which now we're all on virtual teams, but you know, the, the global teams have been virtual pretty much for the last 20 years if not 200, you know, however long you want to call it, but a um, right. common situation would be, uh, this, is a, this is a real situation. I believe it was a British manager, it was a team manager, this is a marketing team, and he had a local 
a person who reported to him from Malaysia and their values were honesty and respect. So it was decided to roll out a global marketing campaign where they were doing like um, coffee and tea meetings to promote their, this again, another software company. Mm -hmm. So they were inviting people for, for tea and to learn more about their software, fine. They wanted to roll it out universally at the exact same week. I'm not quite sure why, but they just, you know, there's some, there's people love the consistency to it. And nobody showed up in the Malaysia event. Wow. Why didn't anybody show up in Malaysia? Well, they ran it during Ramadan where you're not allowed to eat. So here's this Western company putting an advertisement out saying, hey, come and have some, some food and drink with us during Ramadan, which is the most, you know, it's just a, it's a bad, <laughs> a bad campaign. Yes. yes. The question then is why didn't that local manager speak up? He didn't speak up because he was showing respect. At okay. least that's how he saw it. And so the manager in the, in the UK goes, well, wait a minute, what about on whatever happened to honesty? So, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm showing respect. Like that, that's, that, that's as honest as I can be. Like I, I'm not going to correct the boss because I, I, you know, I wouldn't do that. I mean, you know, we shouldn't have done it, but I, there was no way I could have communicated this. And Maybe nine times out of 10, nine times out of 10, the manager in this case, the UK, I'm not picking on UK, but just in this right. example, you know, he's like, that guy's an idiot. I'm going to fire him and replace him. Mm. And again, this, here's that Groundhog Day, right? This is just, okay, you can do that. Maybe you can afford it. Maybe it's going to take a heck of a long time to replace that. Uh, maybe it's going to cause some local brand damage. And, and why would you keep repeating the same problems? Are you going to just keep firing people over and over again? Right. 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 So the question that I have and, and I, what I work with teams is to say, well, you know, who's responsible and what could have been done differently next time or what could be done differently next time to avoid this type of thing. And these are the, I think, the people to people type of uh, situations that more and more of us are working, working through because, you know, so much more of business has gone global, uh, especially this year. It, it's kind of counterintuitive, mm -hmm. but it's kind of counterintuitive, but like there's more global business going on now because of Zoom and Skype right. and, and this other stuff, right? It's just uh, as as we have gone from a leap into more digital business, uh, the the borders become less relevant. It doesn't matter what the politicians are saying. We're we're now in a global team setting more than we've ever been before. So even though the book was written before this whole COVID thing, right. I think the timing is pretty good for it. Well, yes, and people who didn't have to bother with international business before because they were the traveling business people, now they do yep. because all you need is a broadband connection and here you go. You, you, you pick up the Vietnamese yeah. team or the Indian group. In fact, I, I'm, I'm talking to companies all the time, just hopefully clients, but also just doing survey work and interviews just to get a sense. And uh, some of the people here the, in Singapore who work for MNCs that are based back in the West, they're talking to their headquarters more now than ever before. Right. So communication has actually increased because a year ago, it was to say, okay, let's, you know, I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm not bothering this guy that we didn't have a Zoom set up so easy. And by the way, they're coming over here next quarter, three months late, you know, they're, they're coming over for their trip. Yeah, that's right. We'll address all this stuff now. And now it's actually like, oh no, this is a problem. I'm pressing my button and now we're talking. And it's a much more, it's much more frequent interactions. Generally, that's a good thing, but the more interactions, the more communication, the more potential for communication breakdowns. So that's also happening. In this way, there is no body language. There is, there is no small talk. You jump right into business and you have to do it in this small square in front of you. The, uh, the entire setup of conference calls, and this is something that we were, I, I've been looking at for 10 years plus, which is t conference calls, if you think about like some of the uh, invisible stuff that we've talked about earlier or right. alluded to, one of them is how relationships get built. And there, in some models, there would be like task-based countries or parts of the world or mm. people. In other words, they build relationships because 
this, you know, I like you, you get, you get stuff done, you get it back to me on time. You know what you're doing. We have a good working relationship versus right. other parts of the world, which that's kind of irrelevant. It's more about, I need to know this person. I need to understand him or her. We need to have more, you know, slower time to build that trust first. And it, it's not to say there's one side that's right or wrong, but virtual global teams are almost based on the premise of task-based assignments. So I'm on, you know, time no zones context. matter. I've, yeah, I've, I've got a call tonight at 10. Uh, I don't want to be on a call at 10, but we have to, because it's this is how, how the time zones work. We are probably going to jump right into an agenda because people are like, oh, look, I don't want to take up too much time. So let's just plant, let's get through this really fast. Right. Bam, bam, bam. Okay, any next, you know, it's like, it's incredibly structured. I'm fine with that, but at the same time, you do lose the soft, squishy, uh, you know, in uh, just sort of the 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 side chatter and the, you know, uh, just some of the the the, the softer conversations, mm -hmm. right? The the relationship building stuff. So, and so I think that people companies have to be very careful that they don't fall into the trap of just building teams based on agendas. Right. Uh, agendas. Yeah. I, I'm a I'm a fan of agendas. I think that you can use them in in great. They can be very effective and efficient, but they can also be overused, and they can actually be detrimental to a team's uh, okay. well being. Now, here is a scenario for you. Uh, there is a a high level manager from the West, because in a way we both uh, represent the sort of Western culture, and then this manager says. Uh, in the next year, I will have to deal with, let's say, China and one Southeast Asian country that you can, uh, it's, it's up to you. It's, a, it's yep. an amazingly diverse geographic area in terms of yes. culture and everything else. But let's say uh, one uh, Southeast Asian country in China. Now, maybe you can introduce to us how it's different if it's only virtual. Let's say this uh, manager is sitting in a Western country like uh, North America, or Europe or Australia, or New Zealand and so on. And how it is if, let's say, this manager is based in Shanghai, but he's an Asia-Pacific manager. But you meet in a pub or you meet in an online conference or something like this. And this person says to you, Kyle, with your experience in China and Asia, you know, just based on me preparing for this assignment, you know which typical Groundhog Day mistake I will make. Maybe we can specify online or if this person is actually commissioned to this country. You know what is the thing that I have to be most careful about. Could you please let me know? And then the other thing is, what's the one thing I have to prepare myself for? What's the kind of skill I have to work on so that I mitigate that Groundhog Day mistake mm. before mm. I start dealing mm. with my counterparts from Asia? There's a, there's a, a bunch of questions there. And so I, the way I think about this entire thing and what I've I started with the book and I'm continuing it, you know, ongoing, but it's, and it's the subtitle, which is the survival guide to working across a shrinking planet. So the question is to me is what is, what's that survival guide? Like what's in there? Uh, and the first piece of it, which is also the question, the answer to the question is like, what's the one thing? Uh, the first piece of it is actually, it's all about you. You've got to you got to go inward first. Uh, you have to understand what I believe, what makes you tick, what, what, what motivates you, what demotivates you, what are your communication strengths and what are your communication uh, blind, blind areas. And, and again, there's not necessarily a right or wrong to this. I know you, I, I can even see in your background, it looks like you've got a uh, intercultural disc wheel or some, something similar to that. I do. I yeah, that's right. Know. That's the global disc wheel. I'm a huge fan of, 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 of models like Global Disc, of, of, of behavioral profiles that um, help steer people just to give them more of that insight about themselves. Often, and I am certainly guilty of this, uh, as I've already alluded, I know I'm very task focused uh, in terms of how I build relationships. I like getting right down to business. Uh, I'm generally pretty competitive. I'm pretty direct. Uh, I... I'm incentivized at very individualistic levels. Uh, I, another way to say it, I, I don't play well with teams. And that's why I've been on my own, doing my own thing for such a long time. 
Mm. I know this. And I know that there's blind areas um, that come along with that. And those are the areas that I know that I need to work on. So if I am building relationships with people from different parts of the world, I want to be extra aware of the fact that the what I want or what I'm used to might not at all be what the other person wants or oh, is used fantastic. to. So, the, and so, you know, it, the, you know, you want to treat people the way they want to be treated, right? Which is the, the platinum rule. Um, to me, I'm, and I know you know this, um, and I'm sure people have heard it before. It's the biggest thing. Uh, you can be a dominant behavior type who is incredibly task-based and, you know, competitive and focused on driving for success and goal-oriented. You can come to Southeast Asia, let's just call it Southeast Asia for a minute. You can, you can be fine, but you've got to be willing to uh, be flexible for all of the traits that I just mentioned. Because the one thing that you will find is that what you're used to back home does not make you right. You're not necessarily wrong, but it doesn't make you right. Mm. And if you're going to try and be a slap dragon, <laughs> if you're going to try and do your business approach, build your relationships, build your teams, lead your teams the way that you were used to back home, the Groundhog Day moment is that every single thing I've ever experienced over oh, yeah. here is that that will not work. And so you've got to be able to, I think, spend time defining the um, strengths and gaps in, in, in what makes you tick and then be able to work on the tools to be able to, um, to move forward. So that, that's like the number one biggest thing for me, which I continue to work with people on. And quite frankly, it happened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was a prospect. I interviewed him. We were going to do one-on-one -on -one coaching and it was like a, you know, it's a coaching relationship. So it's kind of a date, right? you got to, you got to make sure you're comfortable with the, with the exactly. other person and vice That's versa. The it's the chemistry. And, and as a, as a salesperson, as somebody who wanted the business, I wanted to, you know, I wanted this, but then I met with the guy and I'm like, I'm, I, he thinks he was, he, he was convinced he was right. He came to me, he said, look, you know, I'm, uh, he's from Western Australia. I mean, in, I've inherited this team and cross Southeast Asia. These guys don't get it. They, um, you know, they need to, they need to work. I, they need to work with my team the way I do it. And I'm looking at it. I'm going, I, I just, I'm not going to walk into a, a failed coaching gig. So I, right. you know, it's, it's hard, but you know, it's just like, I'll turn that down any day. If, if, if I don't feel that there's the willingness to uh, be open to the fact that you might not always be right. Uh, just just an, an anecdote to um, kind of underline and confirm what you yeah. said, and then I will ask you my yeah. last question. So uh, once a German manager for a large German industrial conglomerate here in Shanghai that I was coaching, uh, I, I did, I did uh, the assessment. I'm also a big fan of assessments. I did the global disk assessment. I did yeah. some interviews with his team and so on. And then what I zeroed in on was uh, delegation skills. And then we, we sat together... And I said to him, listen, um, I, can, I, I think that our focus is going to be delegation skills. He looked at me and said, you know, my delegation skills are fine. The problem is that nobody does what I tell them to do. <laughs> and I had to make him repeat this twice more until he realized what an irony it is that yes. he's trying to prove here. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you, I've been thinking, of, and sorry to interrupt. I, no, I was thinking no, about please. This. You are the interviewee. Well, I, you know, we talk about idioms and, and local uh, references. So I'm going to give you a sports reference just to right. be, be very American for a minute. But um, well, actually, it doesn't matter about uh, American in this case. The, this um, head of sales, and I, I, I have to pull out the article, but he was arguing that if you're one of those people that always blames the referee for making bad calls against your team, that's kind of indicative of the same thing that we're talking about, right? Yeah. It's like, it's everybody else's fault and problem that, you know, it's, 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 and so it's almost like you're kind of looking for those, um, those clues into what, what motivates yeah. and drives people. Uh, and again, it's not to say that, you know, that can't be changed, but you do, you, you can think, I can think of people who 
they're always it's always about the referee. Yeah, if there is a teacher who's like most students fail the exam eventually, the teacher has to give right. it some thinking. Yes, yeah, that's, that's that's an easier uh, way to think about it. Yeah, but but this is a good one because then working across cultures is always a kind of expectation management. And my last question uh, will address the kind of expectations we go into. Uh, an assignment in a faraway place and then we are slightly miffed and disappointed if the culture doesn't fulfill our expectations. So uh, one example that I can I can bring is this obsession by the international community with China being a Confucian society. So um, they expect their future Chinese colleagues to be uh, obedient, predictable, harmonious and so on. And then they are very much surprised that they are not that way. They are actually quite straightforward. They, yep. can, they can be adamant on what they want and they can find a way to get it. Yes. Um, actually, Chinese managers can, can build a fairly tough environment. And, and to, to illustrate this kind of gap between the expectations and the reality when we experience another culture, here is my favorite sentence from your book. So I am... I am um, reading out something that I wrote for a, for a publication I'm working on. Let's get a drink, says a character in Karl Hegarty's Entrepreneurial Memoir, The Accidental Business Nomad. We can do that Guangxi you Westerners always talk about. <laughs> I love this sentence because it is almost like Westerners are convinced that Guangxi is the heart that makes Chinese society tick. And then for those who haven't met this a phrase before guangxi in chinese literally means connection or or um, or relationship but it is the concept of getting things done through personal relationships and and unofficial channels so on one hand westerners are convinced that this is what they are supposed to learn or even master as as some sometimes we can see in videos and books right but on the other hand this moment it made me smile because it's almost like Chinese people who know us want to want to do us a favor and play the Chinese part because we expect it from them. <laughs> so give us a little bit of background because you know a sentence is never just a sentence. I'm sure that you have you have struggled with this kind of misperception in your work. It's a really tricky one. Um, I had this entire chapter that I actually ended up removing for actually political reasons and because I, I, as i mentioned earlier the names and the places have been changed to protect the guilty uh, i had this one story that it was it was a, such a good story it was very china specific but i couldn't i couldn't mix up the the this the the facts enough to to make it anonymous all right if that makes sense absolutely uh, and so i had to i had to remove it uh, but a big thing from that story was you got this guy, this American guy who built his own business over there. And he was just, you know, he, he was, he was building the relationships to get the whole infrastructure going to build his ecosystem and to get into, you know, high level contacts that would contacts that would help him with his, with his objectives. And one thing went wrong and the entire thing collapsed because nobody would nobody would touch him nobody would talk to him mm. and it was kind of like and and that's exactly what would happen in other parts of the world so you know this concept of oh well we just need to build relationships and so therefore i just need to just spend a lot of time building relationships and all of a sudden everything will work out i've never seen that actually happen and 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 i think that it's it's a um, it's an issue that companies are really uh, Western companies learn the hard way, especially in, in China. Mm. Uh, so it, it's a it's a phrase that I kind of come full circle with. Um, you know, it, 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 there, there's there's an it's an important phrase, uh, and and there's reason behind it and there's history behind it, but it's also something that feels to me like it's been sort of westernized and repackaged as the answer to all of your problems. Yes. And if you just, if you just use a little, sprinkle a little guanxi into the situation, everything will be fine. And I've never seen it work that way. And, and that, that, that line came from a real comment where just, it was a guy from Taiwan and he just, you know, he was, you could see him kind of laughing like, yeah, let's, 
let's do it. Let's let's uh let's, let's do that Guan Chi stuff that you Westerners are all all, all excited about. <laughs> well, I mean, let's let's face it. Most of the foreigners in China I know who are obsessed with Guangxi end up Guangxi with each other. Yes. Yeah. I I, I had I had kind of noted that uh, actually it's, it's too bad I had to take the chapter out because there was a there was a a networking event in Shanghai and it was this moment I I was very new to the region but I was like. This is I'm I'm surrounded by white guys. <laughs> like where are the Chinese people? <laughs> and, and and it exactly. does feel sometimes you know, in Singapore and and you know it does feel like there's oftentimes a um, a, a disconnect between the <laughs> Western companies coming over selling stuff to other Western companies using investment that's coming from headquarters. It's like, well, wait a minute, what is this? And I, and I allude to it in the book, or I tell stories of it where Western companies fill their offices. There's offices here that look like headquarters back in Boston or San Francisco. And, and you're going, well, okay, is this, is this your Asia play? Like you're just, you're, you are literally in this case, cutting and pasting your office and filling it with people from headquarters. Like what's the, what's the localization strategy here? Uh, and, and I think that many companies go through that, that journey, um, in a very expensive way because they realize that they're not going to build mm. real local businesses that way. And I, and I think that that trend is, is actually increasing. I think that there's more need for localization now than there was five or 10 years ago. All right. Uh, I think the markets are coming into their own or they've come into their own and they have their own preferences and they have their own comp. They have their own local ecosystems, like especially in tech, like these, these competitors here, Yes, turning in is like, definitely the name of the game these days. I mean, uh, for for different reasons. Yeah, and 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 not to not to be negative or positive about it, but there's a lot of local competition that's actually really mm. good now, and they've got the local context. Um, I I think about that phrase. It's it's kind of an older phrase, but the liability of foreignness. Right. And the liability of foreignness is an old business school term, which basically just bundles says, okay, if you're opening up into another uh, foreign market. Here's what's here's what you're up against that your local competition is not up against: uh, geographic distance, language, culture, understanding the local rules and regulations, uh, any of those types of things. And if you actually think about your expansion strategy by almost itemizing, okay, what are our liabilities of foreignness? Uh, I think it's changed. I think some of those uh, challenges have have shifted over the years. A lot of the rules, the local laws, HR, you can outsource, like all that stuff is now easy to do. It's the hard stuff is the, is the culture. And, and I think some of the local preference right. and some of the protectionism as well. Right. Uh, right. 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 So it's interesting. Yeah. It's a, well, those who want to hear, I mean, those who want to get familiar with the stories behind all of this, what you're saying, please check the accidental business nomad, which is Kyle's book. And then before we end this conversation, I would just like to, oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, before we end the conversation, I would just like to ask you, what keeps you busy now? Uh, people who have recently finished writing a book, they usually have some free time on their hands. <laughs> um, the, uh, the virtual stuff has, has kicked off to, in a way that companies all had to rush to go virtual and now months later, they're realizing that, okay, this is the way things are heading and we need stronger strategies around that. And those are strategies that we're not going to be able to pick up from a uh, you know, article off of LinkedIn or Forbes, and we're not gonna learn this from a video. So there's there's been more uh, focus on getting teams together. And I, I believe this fundamentally that Distributed teams uh, require distributed answers and solutions. And so I, I think that it's very much uh, getting each team together virtually and having them work through what is their 2021 going to look like. And so as we're uh, doing all this stuff, I keep my computer keeps beeping and blinking. Everyone's trying to do some yeah, session before same, the yeah. end of the year. Yeah. And now uh, we so can that's, be that's what wherever I'm... we are. I mean, there is um, there is gl from global to global. It doesn't matter where you are. The other, you know, the other just a, just the other point, which it, it kind of I don't know if it's common sense to others. Maybe I'm slow, but 
the last two recessions, I'll call this one our, a recession uh, right. that we're in, typically companies consolidate, they focus maybe on their core market. But the last two, uh, and, and, and I wrote the book around the, the really what happened after 2008, 2009, companies are now going global faster in a right. downturn. And the reason is, is because in many cases, the, the stock market, weirdly, their stock's going up a little bit, potentially. They've got some cash on hand. They're looking for where the growth is. Digital makes it easier to do work in different parts of the world. And the markets are rebounding in different ways faster. China, mm. Singapore, South Korea. These are all markets that are turning back on much faster than Western Europe or the U.S., and right now we're going to see, we're about to see this flood. And it's the same thing that happened in 2008, 2009. Tons of new interest started yeah. coming in to this region because the markets are, are back. They're, they're coming on faster. And so I suspect uh, to see another wave of investment and focus and business growth initiatives coming over to where you are, where I am, and the whole region. That's what the numbers say. Anyway, maybe yeah. that would be another conversation. But yes, if you look yeah. at the investment numbers, uh, even yeah. if, if, if trade and the movement of people suffered a lot, the movement of money definitely didn't. And I'm, I was joking. I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to have another book coming because um, you know people are going to put money into this region and make all the same dumb mistakes we all made 10 years ago. So oh, that, here, here comes our Groundhog Day all over again. That joke is uh, not going to remain a joke for a long time. I believe, Gabor, it was the great Yogi Berra who said, uh, it's like deja vu all over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we will look at that next time. Kyle, this was a fantastic excuse for us to catch up. But Absolutely. I also think that we have been useful to everybody who's listening. So thank you very much for, for, Thank you. for joining me and, of course, everybody else who's going to watch this on YouTube and everywhere else. All right. Thanks, Gabor. Have a great afternoon. You too. Bye-bye for now.